psychologist, Dr. Mara Carpell of Dr. Mara Carpell and Your Golden Years. I hope you enjoy this informative interview and many more to come on my program. I am right here in the studio with our next guest, Nancy Cherko, who is an Alzheimer's disease specialist and the executive director of Arden Courts, which is an Alzheimer's disease facility. To talk about Alzheimer's and yes. um, all things Before related. Before we get into the meat of the interview, why don't we start with um, your background? Why don't you tell our listeners right. a little bit well, about your background? I've been. I have had a passion for seniors for many years now. I used to do music programs for about 30 different communities in the Austin area, and I really appreciated how much music made a difference in the residents' lives. So then I created a couple of um, exercise videos for people with dementia, and all of the music was from the 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. and that's gone very well. But after working and getting my certificate in gerontology, I really realized that I thoroughly enjoyed being part of uh, residence life a little bit more than just to come in for the fun stuff for an hour at a time. Right. And at first I didn't want to be involved in that part of it because I didn't want to get too close to people. It was easier to just be there for the fun stuff and leave. And mm -hmm. now I'm really passionate about being part of the family's lives and helping them cope through this through support groups mm -hmm. and uh, working with the residents too to uh, help them achieve the best the best day that they can. So aside from being the executive director of a dementia facility, you're also an ambassador to the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. Association. Yes, I've been the ambassador for six years now and I just came back from Washington DC for the National Advocacy Forum that was held a few weeks ago. And we met with our legislators there to try to push some new legislation for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So there were about 1,200 people there and that's the largest that it's been. It started off at about 200 quite a few years ago. This is the 26th year of wow. the Advocacy Forum. So maybe we could start with that. Okay. Can you tell us about some of the new legislation <clears throat> sure. that's in the works? Uh, there's a few new things that have just come up now. One of them is the Hope for Alzheimer's Act, and that stands for Health Options Planning and Education. And what we have found is that people, once they get a diagnosis, they have nowhere to go or they just leave the doctor's office and then that's it. So through this Hope for Alzheimer's Act, uh, we're looking for legislation so that there would be more Medicare dollars available for people so that once they got the diagnosis, they could meet with the social worker and the doctor mm -hmm. and their loved one and all come together as a group to have some sort of uh, service plan or, you know, a different kind of plan for the person throughout the rest of the disease. And the other, um, the other act that they've been working on is kind of a strange name, but it's called Pachita, and it's a palliative care, health education, and um, it's towards working with nurses and doctors to help educate them on approach techniques for people with dementia, and also learning about palliative care and hospice, because a lot of times Although we know what the end result of the disease is, mm -hmm. palliative care and hospice kind of get a bad rap through all of this. And so to try to keep someone as comfortable as possible in the later stages, in the last mm -hmm. stage of the disease, so that they can stay in their home, whether that be in a community such as ours or at their home, and hospice can come in and provide services right. to that family member so that they can just you know, be able to rest and um, live out the last days mm -hmm. where they're mm -hmm. comfortable. Right. And palliative care isn't always hospice. That's right. It's just providing the pain medication That's right. and mm -hmm. things that a lot of doctors don't want to right. give if you're, you know, in a different stage of your life. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree it's very important. Mm -hmm. Very important. So Maybe you can talk a little bit about some coping mechanisms that families can use. As you said, you like to work with the families, and mm -hmm. you know it must be very difficult for a family when they learn this diagnosis of their loved one. Yes, it is, and I think you know, um, from my perspective, it's much easier for me as I tell the family members. I don't have the precious memories. I also don't have all the baggage 
from the childhood with the person. So we just love the resident and get to know the resident from where they are and we live in their world. And a lot of times the family, that's new news to them to try to cope with their loved one by not correcting them on what year it is and who they are, what their role is in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, they get, the resident maybe gets confused and your first your first inclination is to correct that person and it's it's very stressful on both the caregiver and on the person who has the disease too. Sure. So, and also, you know, giving yourself a break as far as being the caregiver, as far as getting some respite help. If you need to have your loved one be away for a few days, if you have to go on a trip for a few days, you know, find a community such as Arden Courts or another community that would be able to take them for four or five days so mm -hmm. that you can get sometimes just a much needed rest and right. stay home and, mm -hmm. and regroup a little bit. But also there's a lot of good respite day programs, especially uh -huh. in the Austin area. And I'm sure throughout the country there are. Most of them are uh, free, run by the churches and a lot of volunteers. And those are very good. They're usually a four or five hour type of uh, program and you know they provide snacks and that sense of community that the resident needs that a person really needs that sense of community rather than being isolated at home all the time and right. not having anyone to talk to and you have that sense of purpose sometimes even just feeling that they're helping someone else uh, we have uh, one family that their loved one went to a place for three years and what he did was shred papers Mm -hmm. And he really was convinced that they needed him there once a week because they had all these papers that needed shredding and there was no one else that was able to do it uh -huh. such as he could. Right. So, you know, it's that sense of purpose that the person has to have. You mm -hmm. know, many of our residents that we have feel that they work there. Sometimes one lady last week was complaining about the pay uh -huh. that she would, you know, like a raise. And, and my uh, nurse Odessa said, well, I'll talk to the management and see if we can bump you up a little bit. Right. And um, we just started just the past few weeks. Um, the nurse had the idea of using some play money, not in a childish nature, but especially some of the gentlemen will say, well, you know, I need some money for lunch or I'd like to give the, the caregiver a tip you know, because they helped me out. And mm -hmm. so we've been building that out and it's been working fairly well, wow. actually. Yeah, really? yeah, okay. it looks so. pretty realistic too. So, okay. yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to be working very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, in terms of dealing with their own distress about their loved one having this diagnosis of Alzheimer's, do you have any tips on that? Well, getting enough exercise and eating the right foods and getting rest for yourself is very important as a caregiver. And reaching out to the community, there's a sense of being very alone most of the time and being in a support group really reassures you that you are not the only one in this disease. It's a very tough journey. Mm -hmm. More for the caregiver, I really believe, than for the person with the disease itself. In the beginning, the person with the disease is aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But as the disease progresses, they are blissfully unaware of, of what is going on with them. They do have their moments of lucidity, and that's tough on family members to take and on the mm -hmm. resident themselves. Mm -hmm. But um, to be able to accept the fact that that person has a few moments of lucidity, but other than that, just meet them where they are and live in their world. And it will right. be a lot easier for you, as I'm sure you, you know, dealing mm -hmm. with what you've dealt through yes. in your life too. It, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I, we talked a bit about, you found some, you found something where, you know, asking people what to do for them mm -hmm. if they ever, have to mention one, yes. of the, one of the things on that list, as you read it to me, was about meeting, you know, meeting people where they are. That's right. right. That's yeah. right. It's a it's a good article. It was it's from nextavenue.org, and it was rules for a good life. And one of the things was, if I get dementia, I want my friends and family to embrace my reality. And if I think my spouse is still alive, or that we're visiting my parents for dinner 
then let me believe those things because I'm happier for it. Right, and when you read that to me, it reminded me of when I worked in a nursing home in New York where they mm -hmm. had an Alzheimer's unit or a dementia unit, and right. there were residents there who would constantly ask, have you seen my mother, have you spoken to my mother, or they couldn't come to my group unless, you know, the group that I ran for them, um, unless I let, you know, the, the one resident's mother know where she was. Mm -hmm. So the staff there would constantly tell these two residents that their mother had died. So every day yes. was like they would have to grieve it all over again. They and what a horrible upset. thing to have to go through that every single yes. day, that, that new grief. So I would have to talk to the staff, mm -hmm. you know, don't, don't do that. That's right. <laughs> you know, I would tell this one resident, I already spoke to your mother, and she said it's mm -hmm. okay. And then she would smile and say, well, then it's okay with me if my mother said it's That's okay. That's right. Um, but they didn't like that, the staff. Do you have a hard time with that, convincing people to do that? Because We do with the families. Um, mm -hmm. The staff is uh, pretty well in tune to it now because they know that it works. And nothing works all the time, mm -hmm. every single time. Right. But for the most part, just living in that person's world and saying, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry doesn't necessarily mean that you're responsible for all of it or that uh, you can take charge of all of it but that you're sorry that they're upset. They need to know that you're empathizing with them. Mm -hmm. So living in their world is just much easier for everybody. And it is hard on the families because they'll say, well, my, you know, they'll say, mother, don't you know who I am? Mm -hmm. And so I'll tell them sometimes, you know, say, my mom, it's me, I'm your favorite daughter. You know, right. and the interesting thing is sometimes you run across a family, there was one family that in particular said, you know, I kind of like the way my mother is now because we never got along and she favored my sister and she was much kinder to my sister and now she tells me she loves me every day and she gives me hugs okay. and she well, said I'll really take sweet. that. So that was very sweet, it was very endearing to see that those kind of things do happen too. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a real challenge to get family members on the same page, siblings especially. Mm -hmm. um, to get them to all agree on even, you know, that their loved one should be in a community. And sometimes it has to do with money. It's not always about money, but many times it does, you know, where a person feels, we have a few that have felt like, well, that's my inheritance. And mm -hmm. I try to work with them to tell them that this is your mom's rainy day. Right. You know, this is what she has saved for. And if your mother were in her right mind and completely lucid, she would not want you taking care of her. She would not want her son helping her with toileting issues and things like that. There's a real dignity factor with that. Sure, so, sure. And one of the uh, items on this list, Rules for Good Life, says, you know, it's not your fault. Don't feel bad if you can't take care of me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Find me a good place to live where they'll care about me mm -hmm. and know that I'm safe because, and, and lose the guilt about it. Right. So. Right. And it. And I would imagine that the quality of the relationship is a lot better when you're not the 24-hour caregiver. Absolutely. Right? You don't have to be the food police, mm -hmm. the clothing police. You can just enjoy them. Um, you know, a spouse especially. You know, just enjoy a friendly visit with them, and not tell them that they can't go outside, and not re recorrect them about the TV or the bills and things like that. Right. Right. And you know our our community the way it's set up especially in the evening you know so many people have sundowning issues which is you know there's a lot of science going on about that as far as the time of day and the lighting but things like that lighting has a lot to do with it if a person is home and isolated even the television the shadow of themselves walking by the television if the shades are up in the evening will make them feel that there's an intruder in the home. Mm -hmm. we've, had, we've had a lot of instances where people from their home had called the police because they saw someone walk by and it was actually their own shadow in the, in the television set. Okay. Or the windows, it's best to turn the shades down in the evening. So things like that we have learned through you know, many years of experience and so we do mm -hmm. know what works as far as that. Right, right. So. Okay. Maybe you can read a couple of other sure. items on there because sure. that's um, a great list. One of them is, if I get dementia, ask me to tell you a story from my past. Which many times, you know, that's 
the reminiscing is one of the ways you can really connect with your parent or with your loved one. Mm -hmm. And this one to me is always important. If I get dementia, don't talk about me as if I'm not in the room. Yeah. Many times I'll have, you know, I'll say to the family, you know, they can hear you. They have dementia, but they're not deaf. Right. You know, they can hear what you're saying. They may not be able to process it, but give them that dignity. And one of the other ones was, um, if I get dementia, treat me the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And that helps too. And also, um, if I get dementia, know that I still like to receive hugs and handshakes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And many times people forget that too. They start to be a little bit aloof. And I think some of it is because they are afraid and they're not quite sure how they are going to be treated. And being received by the person. Always approach from the front, <clears throat> never approach from the back, never tap somebody on the shoulder who has dementia because you startled them. So there's a six foot rule and then three feet where you extend your hand with your palm up so that the person does not feel threatened like you're going to take them and bring them someplace where they don't want to be. Always mm -hmm. extend your hand. Mm -hmm you know, with the palm up for that. Right. So dif different, you know, there's... I would imagine yeah. that has to do with that feeling that they're losing control in their life. and so. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And always remember, too, that people like to be invited to family gatherings. Don't um, eliminate them just because they have dementia. Talk to the other family members and the guests beforehand so that they won't be embarrassed. We had one family near Thanksgiving who all of the family members wore name tags. And it worked very well. They uh -huh. gave one to their mother, and they gave one to all the grandchildren, so mm -hmm. the grandmother could then save face. And right. uh, everybody had their own little name tag, and that uh -huh. worked out very well. That's so you idea. know, different tricks like that, so that uh -huh. they're because quizzing somebody, and you know, the timing involved in that. We've had people come and visit who hadn't seen their mom for a few months, and they spend the whole day there and leave to go to the restroom. And as, when they come back, the mom is all upset. You know, it's been months. I haven't seen you. Where have you been? And, you know, I've only been gone five minutes. I just went out the door. And right. So, you know, those kind of reality things, you really have to work through with the family members. And um, we try to do that by having education and doing some role playing with the family members, mm -hmm. too. And I think a lot of times family members see how other families work and interact with each other and that helps them cope mm -hmm. with it too. Mm -hmm. So that, that's when the support groups really come in handy. Right. And a person doesn't feel so alone, but they also sometimes feel, you know what, I don't have it too bad. My mom still knows who I am and my mom still knows she loves me. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, sometimes with a spouse too, my spouse still knows who I am. Right. So. So yeah. I know that you mentioned that you wanted to talk a little bit about realistic expectations for mm -hmm. the family. So maybe you can talk a bit about yes. that. Yes, um, especially I guess in a community, the expectations are that sometimes as the disease progresses, your loved one may not recognize you. They also may not want to change their clothing every single day. They might want to wear the same clothes the same because they're familiar to them. We have many family members who will get their uh, loved one an outfit that's three of them that are the same. Now, the sad part of the disease is that it does progress and we're never sure exactly how it will progress. Many times people want to know exactly, well, what stage do you think my mom is in now? And so many times there's um, where they're not in exactly one stage because things can overlap from one stage to the other. Mm -hmm. So I usually give them that um, staging tool. There was a good one, uh, Tim Cummings has done a good mm -hmm. staging tool. Mm -hmm. And I encourage family members, especially if they're not in the community, to use that staging tool and have your sibling even use the staging tool because many times they don't agree. If one is living out of town, they'll say, oh, mom knows what she had for lunch. Well. She doesn't, you know, the mom okay. in town knows that the mom doesn't remember things like that. But right. it gives you a good baseline to know exactly where they are in the disease. And, you know, try not to lose hope as far as, you know, we're hoping that there will eventually be a cure. But there are some good medications out there that don't slow the process of the disease or the progress of the disease, but they will help mask some of the symptoms. 
Mm -hmm. And so, you know, talk with the doctor about yeah, what and I might I think work. it's really important that, you know, and I and I know when Dr. DeVere was on the show, mm -hmm. um, who was also very active in the Alzheimer's Association, yes. um, he said that it's really important if somebody has a memory issue not to be afraid to be evaluated because it isn't always Alzheimer's. It is not always Alzheimer's. Many times uh, we find with people that it's poor nutrition is one or, you know, mm -hmm. the vitamin B12 or the mm -hmm. vitamin D. There's many things. And, you know, so if you look at the two or three things that might be going on with your loved one, it's not necessarily dementia. And so you really have to not be afraid to look into that because a lot of things can be reversed. You know, right. it's a lot better nutrition or, you know, sometimes it's just blood pressure medication, things mm -hmm. like that. There's a lot. And many times someone living at home doesn't take the correct dosage of the vitamins mm -hmm. or, or some of the medications, the medications. and that can that can have an right. effect on them too. Right. We had one resident who came in just a few weeks ago and the family member said, well, they're good about taking their medication. And they were shocked when they brought their mom in because in both sides of her easy chair, there were pills, probably at least three months worth of pills oh. all tucked underneath the cushions. Oh boy. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, things like that. It's, it's hard to know exactly Many times people think that their child is poisoning them, you know, it, mm -hmm. and that's the reality. Like you had shared a story about your dad, too. There's no arguing with reality. If, if it is their reality, that is, it is what it I is. I mentioned to you that my dad, yeah. he didn't have Alzheimer's, but he had uh, vascular dementia. Right. Most of the time that he was really with it, but he'd have these moments, like just upon waking up from sleep, especially, or a bad dream. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's hard. I've noticed with people with Alzheimer's and also people with any kind of dementia that sometimes they have a hard time distinguishing the dream from reality. Sometimes the dreams are so real. Yes. And then trying to argue about the dream just being a dream just doesn't really work. No, you're just wasting your breath yeah. and, and you get them more agitated mm -hmm. because of it. Right. You know, then the, and you don't want to want them to lose that trust that they have with you. Right. That's right. And music helps with that too. Right. You know, one of the other suggestions in that um, list there was if I get dementia, I want to hear my favorite music, not yours. You know, right. um, okay. and many times, you know, some caregivers at, at some communities might say, oh, you know, they love the 60s music. Well, they don't love the 60s music. You love the 60s music. They like the 40s music. Right. You know, <laughs> and they may, you know, be sociable enough to enjoy it a little bit with you, but it really is not going to hit home for them like the 40s music. Right. So, okay. And as we know, you know, we're all aging there, so pretty soon it's going to be the 50s music that's right. going to be. Right. right? When and all the baby boomers get there, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so Nancy, if people want to learn more about your facility, which mm -hmm. is here in Austin, Texas, the yes. Ports, or if they want to um, find out more about Alzheimer's disease, if they live in Texas or if they live anywhere else mm -hmm. around the country, are there websites they can go to? There are. Um, Ardencourts.com, Arden-Courts.com is our website, and you could then put in you know the Austin Territory. There's many Arden courts throughout the country. Okay. So uh, there's three in Texas, and there's many, especially okay. in the Northeast. There's a lot of them. Okay. So they don't have to be in Austin. To no. And there's a Facebook account for Arden courts too. I think okay. it's Facebook Arden courts. And for the Alzheimer's, there's an Alzheimer's Association, which is alz.org, and then there's a Texas link for Texas Alzheimer's. And that's txalz.org. And that's more of a local community for here in Austin for the Central Texas area. Okay. So, all right. Well, yeah. I'm going to post all of these on my website well, later tonight you. or early tomorrow morning. So right. if people missed it, they can just go to my website and the post about the show and click on the links to take them right, right. to it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much for... Thank you. It's